would not now be having community transmission if we had engaged in the communities the way we should have engaged them in the first place. Because they would have learned about it. They would have put each other responsible to wear masks, to socially distance and to do whatever. But now it was something that was coming like from the top down. And you know, most of the time it's like, ah, let them talk to, to, to themselves. So that we, you know, communities would have really made sure, made sure that we engage even in uh, activities that we know people have to engage in despite COVID-19, but they're socially distanced. Let me give you an example. The, fetch, the collecting of pani by women. Pani, hella ma pani. You know, the lockdown did not allow women to go and collect pani. And pani is not going to sit on a tree and wait for you and say, yeah, we'll wait for you until lockdown. Hell no. So that this is an area where if we had engaged the chiefs properly, the chiefs would have said, pani is a very socially distanced thing. No woman shares a tree with another. So they would have allowed the women to say, go 7 a.m., go out, collect pani, 4 p.m., be back. And, and the, as it is, Pani was all over the, 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 you know, the main roads, whatever, even entering people's homes, but uncollected. So that's economic mm -hmm. you know, failure right, right away. Those women who have been able to collect their Pani and sell it, especially right now, but they, they weren't able to. So that it, those are some of the shortcomings that I saw even in other countries, uh, but where sometimes people were very assertive, as in Malawi. When Malawi, they tried to, to, to do a lockdown, the people simply said, hell no, we sell our tomatoes, our livelihood is out there in the street, we'll socially distance, but we are not going to lock down. They refused. So, so that we, it, it, it has been different you know, uh, ways and all that. But I think we have learned a lot out of that. And maybe in future epidemics, we'll really say, let's engage, or even now in this epidemic, to say, let's now really engage communities even more. because." We keep saying having those second waves, third wave, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Right. Uh, Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa has, uh, on average, the worst healthcare in the world. Um, mm. I mean, this is according to, to the World Bank. Not that we have to trust, you know, all the information coming from the World Bank. Because sometimes... That's what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't go to Asia. Exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, anyway, so, okay. so I'm skeptical when, when I hear things like, like, like that from yes. those organizations. You well, know. as I mean, you, you know, like me who's, who's traveled, who has traveled the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm left with only 18 countries in the whole world. Where uh -huh. I've, uh, some I don't even want, to, even want to go there. And so to hear that, uh, anyway, let's, let's take it at face value. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so that same, you know, obviously the infrastructure, infrastructure is poor. Um, uh, it accounts for nearly, uh, healthcare in Africa, it accounts to nearly, uh, let's say 1% of global health expenditure and 3% of world's health workers. That's what they say. Yes. So, and, 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 and so infrastructure is poor, right? Making access to, to, uh, to the yes. even most basic medical care is definitely difficult. Yes, yeah. To me, so to me, it, 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 it is an issue of investing in research, science, and technology uh, because um, now there are new technologies from apps to computer control, vending machines, and so forth. Uh, so, Professor, what is, what is it holding? What is it that, that is holding us from investing in research, medicine, and technology in our countries? You know, I think one of the things has been to really copy from the Western countries what they are doing. I'll tell you, during the time when Botswana did not have the CAT scans, you know, the CAT scanners and all that, mm -hmm. we, we had primary health care. Mm -hmm. Before the advent of HIV, our infant mortality rate has gone, had gone down to around 18, 19 per thousand. We were comparable to the, uh, the social democracies of Sweden and all that. It just that with us, HIV yeah, then came and spoiled the thing. But even when I was a minister, I was saying to them, primary health care is still the way to go. That basic health care that is available, affordable, that you know, the communities have a say in, and you engage them. So I think we lost that. Mm -hmm. Somewhere with HIV, because of the technologies that are coming in, Africa lost it and concentrated too much 
on infrastructure, building things and all that. A lot of the things you could have accomplished with just clinics, for example, 24 hour clinics with maternity, we could have done quite a lot and just ensure that we have staffing in there. We have family welfare educators who are right away in you know, community health care workers who are working in the communities, ensuring and promoting health rather than waiting for people to become sick, come to the hospital and then say, we don't have infrastructure, we don't have beds, we don't have, you know, so that's really what has happened. But on the other hand, we need also to be in tune with the rest of the world in that, yes, research is very important. Uh, you know, the, 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 during my time, we had a department of health research in the Ministry of Health. Uh, you know, we, we, in fact, it was actually the person who was in charge of it now is, has been opposed by Dr. Tedros at WHO. She's one of the directors there. So she started with me as being the director of health research and really encouraging our professionals, especially academics, to do research with other institutions so that we can be able to benefit from, from that. During my time, we, had, uh, we were doing research with the Harvard AIDS Institute. Mm -hmm. And it helped me as a minister. For example, we knew that if you give women AZT at 34 weeks, it will prevent mother-to-child transmission. But we, I had to ask the Botswana Harvard Partnership to say, but when does transmission occur in a, the average Botswana women? So they did that study that was just specific for us. And we're able to see that transmission occurs around 28 weeks. So our then, the model then became not 34 weeks, but earlier. Give that AZT at 28 weeks. And we saw that mother to child transmission rate go down, you know, very substantially. So it's, it's, it's really a question of concentrating and making sure that as Africans, we put more money into research, mm -hmm. research that will benefit us, whether it's duplicating what's happening in other countries or not. But look at what's happening now with COVID-19. We are all crying for a vaccine, a, a people's vaccine for everybody. But then our countries are not joining in the search for a vaccine. I would have expected that a lot of our presidents would have encouraged their universities to say, look, if any one particular candidate, uh, you know, uh, is being considered for, 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 for vaccine, for, for COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. let's uh, volunteer and join them. We, in Botswana, we had joined, before I became a minister, I was working with the Harvard AIDS Institute and we we're doing a research on a, an HIV vaccine. It wasn't effective, that particular candidate that we're using. But the point is, we were showing that we want to be part and parcel of what's happening in the world. I expected more African countries, not just South Africa and Uganda and Kenya, to join in the, the, the search for a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Lace with uh, Russia, lace with America, and just ensure, and, and make sure that the CDC, the, our Center for Disease Control in Africa, to, to make sure that they, they, they really encourage that. It has not happened the way I would like it. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that uh, in future we can really know that when there is research to be done, if we want to benefit, we should also be part and parcel of it. Oh, that's one, because that, that's one, one of the questions that I was going to ask you about. But somebody's asking, Professor, so does Botswana, yeah. not excluding South Africa, this is the question that was forward to me before, uh, have, have adequate COVID testing capability and PPE supply in all regions, including rural areas? Uh, not from what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. not from what I'm seeing. I think for us, the only thing that really was a saving grace is that uh, they, we've had very few cases, although and for 2 million people, that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we've had, um, I don't know whether it's 13 or 16 deaths, you know, 16 too many. But uh, there has not been that adequate in the sense that we have had to get them from outside and once we get them from outside, everybody wants them. And therefore, they're going to look for their own first. Same thing with personal protective equipment. When I ask, not just in Botswana, in all the other uh, countries, yeah, countries, you know, as one who's doing nursing now to say, are there adequate uh, personal protective equipment for nurses, for doctors, for health personnel in general? Mm -hmm. The 
permanent secretaries will say to me, yes, we have enough, we are okay. But when you go on the ground to the people who are doing the scat work, the nurses tell you, no, we're having to rewatch uh, some of the things that we are using. So that you, you, you get two separate answers. So that, yeah, no, I would, not, I would say there's not enough. And I'm hoping with what we have learned, in future, we should have concentrated uh, you know, PPE equipment in the countries and at least even manufactured because some of these are just ordinary things, masks, gowns and all that. Yeah. They can be, we can be able to get people to do them. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, be able to have our own supply rather than rely on everybody else's because right now it wasn't like this was a real pandemic where everybody needed something. And therefore it was a question of, you know, America first or, you know, Russia first. So we need to be able to, to, to have that self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, so in, in other countries, uh, even here in the U.S., um, the most affected groups of, by COVID-19 are the poor minorities and the elderly. Um, which groups are the most affected in Africa? Do you know? Maybe just talk in about Africa. Botswana or, or South Africa. Uh, no, uh, I can talk about Africa in general. In no, general the, the, the and African, the affected groups are still the our own minorities because we are, you know, mm -hmm. for us minorities would be mostly. Well, I'll tell you, the people who are getting infected are mostly people of Caucasian, especially in South Africa. But those who are dying because of that lack of um, care and sometimes the underlying. Uh, the diseases or the underlying conditions that are already there have been some of the poor, uh, you know, black people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Botswana, it's been the elderly because of that very thing of the underlying. The, I mean, people who, who have who have died have been mostly o o older people, over fifty, over sixty, because of those underlying things of diabetes and all that. Yeah. So it, 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 it you know it, it has uh, yeah it has been like that. So how but people... in terms of being infected, mm -hmm. you know, young people are also being infected. Yes. It's just that they are able to carry it well. Mm -hmm. And they come, you know, I'll have, a, let's say, my grandchild getting infected in school. They don't show, but they come, they infect me. I lost one of my cousins just um, a few, um, uh, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And um, she was infected by her grandchild mm -hmm. from school. Mm -hmm. The grandchild never showed anything. But it was that, and then the, her two daughters also were infected. But guess what? She was over 70, and she was the one who passed away. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mm. I'm also interested in how people with HIV are responding to COVID. Um, because obviously that's... What I'm finding, mm -hmm. what I'm finding is that when people are on ARVs, mm -hmm. and because they also frequent the hospital, I mean, what the health facilities, they actually are not succumbing, so they're just fine. But it's those who have not tested, but who are living with HIV, that you know, get, get, get affected. Because it's already finding an immune system that's compromised. So uh, that has happened. But, but so far, at least in Botswana, it's been very few. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're happy you know, for that. I know of maybe only one or two who got infected, but they're fine now. Because immediately we saw what was happening, it was like, get on ARBs right away. So, you know, the okay. immune systems were able to get to, to, to pick up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But really, in terms of they themselves, their participation in the COVID response, it could have been much better. Mm -hmm. You know, we already had an army of people who had forced the governments to put up ARBs to do something about the AIDS response. So they are so used, I mean, they're already advocates. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, they know how to lobby and all that. So these are the very people we could have used to say, look, we are now making you the COVID, COVID uh, soldiers. And while you are in the communities out there, make sure that you carry condoms, make sure that you look at, um, you know, homes to see if they find out if there are any cases of discord so that we prevent uh, gender-based violence. Make sure that if there are any people who do not have ARVs, yeah, you carry ARVs for them. Because some people who, had, who, are on, um, who are on ARVs, we're not too sure, like if my supply ends, am I then, you know, would I be, at, would I be wrong then to go to the clinic or whatever? That message was not very clear. 
it became clearer later when now they just like, no, they can even actually be given two months supply. So that's really, you know, what was happening. So we could have used those uh, people because, I mean, people living with HIV have really gone through quite a lot and they know the system and, you know, they know their communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit about the, the vaccine, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, yes. And so we know that, you know, Russia just rolled out their own, you know, and America is, is, is planning or is preparing to roll out theirs. Um, mm -hmm. What is your opinion on it? In the, so, so that in the event when we have one, can we afford it? Um, it? Well, it depends. I have no idea when they're rolling out how much they're charging. Yeah. But I mean, the world is now united to say we do want a people's vaccine. That, that's a what vaccine I was, that, that will be available to everybody. Yes. regardless of who you are, mm -hmm. regardless of where you are, mm -hmm. regardless of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what your circumstances are. Mm -hmm. So that that's like lobbying. In fact, today, like, you know, WHO, UNAs, they were all over mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. that. But in the ultimate, you know, any one country, I mean, if they have their own vaccine, they can be able to roll it out and we're hoping that they'll have enough doses that they can be surplus. But ideally, the world should be able to share because we have agreed, actually, as to who should get priority okay. in terms of a vaccine. Mm -hmm. We agree that it's the healthcare workers. I mean, in every country, because in the ultimate, they're the ones who are right there. Then the older adults, mm -hmm. you know, because we know that they're the ones that are vulnerable. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that that kind of rollout will then come out to, to the point where, yes, yeah, it can get to even the infants and all that. But, you know, unlike all our other vaccine vaccinations, where we are starting with infants, they give them BCG. This is our time. We are starting with people like me to say <laughs> those are the ones who are vulnerable. Give it to them. So right. we don't know how it's going to, to, you know, to, 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 to pattern out. But at the same time, remember, we also have the so-called conspiracy theories. I talked about the people's vaccine and a lot of people right here in, in, in Africa phoned me to say, Sheila, when it comes, I'm not going to take it because, uh, you know, we've heard that they're going to be putting some things in there that will kill Africans, especially now that they're seeing that Corona did not kill us. Why should they start with us? So it, 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 there is that thing. We need a lot of education when it does come mm -hmm. to, to really ensure so that people are, uh, you know, people have that sense mm -hmm. of trust. Mm -hmm. in, in what's going to happen, yeah. Now that makes sense because there was a lab in, in, in Germany uh, who said that they wanted to test in Africa, you know? It was actually France. It was that, there that was, was a lab, lab in France. And there was a lab in France, who yeah. Were actually going to say, no, we should test it in Africa because they're the ones who are poor. Who are, and so I think that messed up people's minds to the point where really they don't trust this vaccine. So mm -hmm. anytime I say the people's vaccine, it should be throughout the world. They say, no, Sheila, let them start there. If yeah. they don't die, it can come over. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, the conspiracy <laughs> theories are there. But I think in the ultimate, you know what? We are one world. We need to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is the one area where it has been shown that the world is one. We believe in science and we believe in medicine, yes. basically. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's, let's do the... Um, this gender-based uh, violence thing, um, yes. especially in Botswana, but but really it's not a Botswana thing alone. No. You know, it, it seems like things are escalating. Uh, yeah. Perhaps maybe it's because of you know what's going on with uh, the, the COVID you know situation. Uh, yes. But is but is it uh, a mental health issue? Should we blame this on patriarchy? Uh, it's a combination of factors. It is a mental health issue in the sense that, look, we have brought up our male children mm -hmm. to be providers. Mm -hmm. Even the Bible sees them as providers. Now, come COVID, this very male child mm -hmm. has no job. He's been restrained. Mm -hmm. So he is now locked down with a family. He has nowhere to go. And he has a family that he has to feed. So half the time, it is that kind of stressor that would make him lash out there for 
to the least, uh, you know, to the most vulnerable in the home. So we have that aspect. But we also have that aspect of patriarchy where in any event, we have always had a control in somebody. And because we are working, most of the time we are outside and we came and saw each other in the evening, which was fine. Suddenly there is a lockdown and you are locked with this very monster, you know. So there is not really a question of doing, not doing, you know, new things. This person is probably say, doing the same thing that they've been doing. But because now they're actually locked down with you, you have no escape. You are right there with them. And because the police and all that cannot come, you know, they, they can then therefore be able to really do whatever they want. So, and that's how come even, you know, young girls have been sexually abused. Because now they're right there with that, with that person who was potentially the potential abuser. But now because they're right there with them 24-7, He's, you know, he has access and can be able to therefore abuse the child. So that it has that, that kind of thing. And we say, well, how do we get rid of it? We can get rid of it. Okay, patriarchy will, will, will still be there. But we need, therefore, better upbringing of our children. That takes a while. But for now, we need to ensure really that the COVID-19 you know, epidemic does not uh, give uh, you know, family so much stress that sometimes they have to just take it out on other people. So we're hoping that as we recover, more people will have their jobs back uh, so that they can be able to work. More people will be able to then work outside. Children will be able to go to school so that, that you know, they're, they're spending time away from home and come back, can come back home and be happy with seeing each other rather than where you are now cooped up. So it has a myriad of, of, of factors that um, I think uh, we, you know we 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 can be able to look to look into. But for us in Botswana, the very fact that our task force did not even have a female who could be able to advise and to say, look, like the very first time, you know, there were no uh, uh, tall numbers for women who are being abused. If, if there had been a woman in there, they would have known that there is that possibility that somebody could be abused and therefore let's have 12 free numbers for women who are being abused so that they can be able to have a place to call for children so that they can be able to have a place to call and be helped. That thing was not there. It was not until much later when cases were being reported. So we are actually now like, you know, getting rid of something when it's already been done and it's, it's not easy. Yeah. yeah, you actually answered my, 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 my next question because I was going to ask you about, uh, um, about the, 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 pres the presidential, you know, task team. But yeah. I thought, because I thought that, that you, you would make a perfect, you know, team member. When I thought about it, like, couple, when I yeah. thought about it a couple of months ago, I was like, Professor Shilatlo is supposed to be in here. But, it's okay. I was like, but at the same time, I was like, no, I know they're doing a great job, you know. But I think it would be nice, yeah. you know, to have him. No, I, I would have done a great job because I would have <laughs> emphasized the community aspect. Mm -hmm. Right away, I would have said we need all the community health care workers to be stationed at community level. Mm -hmm. We need all of them to be stationed at schools to be able to assist the teachers to come in. When, as they come in, they take the children's temperatures. They make sure that children are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. They go in there and make, they make sure that even in the school, the, you know, the, the desks are socially distanced. As it is, that was being done by security guards. Mm -hmm. Now, you know a security guard honestly cannot be able to take. Now with the 36.2, they don't even know what that is. So no. the, in a lot of schools, that's exactly what was happening. And that's why right now, a lot of our outbreaks are coming out of schools. Mm. If they had been the public health nurses and the community health care workers there in all our schools, I don't, I, I think we'd be talking about a, a different, uh, you know, story. But so, then we had technocrats who are male and who to them is like, we're going to use, we use fences before we um, put in mouth, we'll use fences again with human beings. And that's why Botswana is still divided. You, you know, it's like, you cannot cross this zone. Yet within a zone, there are hot spots. You know, we could learn, we could have learned even from the AIDS response because in any one city in the AIDS response, we know there are hot spots. 
Mm. If I want to intervene in Haboro, I go to all Naledi when it comes to the AIDS response. I go to the beer halls and all that. So same with the COVID response. It's not like the whole of Haboron. A school, you are able to then isolate that school and make sure that people do you know, what, what needs to be done. But now it will be like, no, we'll do contact tracing. So you are running all over Haboron contact tracing. Ah, no. I, I think it's, you know, in our case, I really think God has, was really having mercy on us. Right. The way sometimes the response, the, you know, the reaction was, it could have gone worse. Mm-hmm. But we are still there and we're hoping that um, as we go around, because now the cases are going up, mm-hmm. we're hoping that we will reach a peak mm-hmm. and or really they'll have to redo some of their thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are they consulting with you with some of these things? No. No. Okay. So here is I, the question. You know, you know what? I, I was asked by the South Africans to join the task force mm-hmm. and I refused and said, no, uh, you know, we have asked countries to do task forces. Mm -hmm. I want to go and join mine, you know, in my own country. And I did volunteer. But I guess they wanted fewer members or they didn't want anybody from the AIDS response. So that was it. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So that was it. But I mean, I'm ready if anybody, I mean, I can't even say, if anybody right now, if the president, for example, called me tomorrow and mm-hmm. said, I want you to join the task force, I would gladly do it. Yeah. Okay. Because in the ultimate, I do have ideas of what we can do. And people are not implementing those ideas. We'll love to see you. We'll love to see you doing it. Yes. <laughs> uh, but now that we're talking about leadership, uh, and I asked the same, pretty much I asked the same question to Boholo when, when, when I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. So during the pandemic, we saw the likes of New Zealand, Jacinda Arden, uh, Denmark's Fredriksen, Gen- uh, Germany's Angela Merkel, and Taiwan Tsai Ing-wen, right? Receiving global yeah. acclaim for their responses to the pandemic. Uh, and it seems to me that the leadership traits are different from the ones associated with men. I could be wrong. So at the same time, we don't want to discredit all men. Yeah. <laughs> all men, you know, uh, some have done a lot of for their communities and nations. Professor, do you think women make better leaders than men? You know, I believe that we all have leadership traits. Okay. It's just that both men and women, Mm -hmm. it's just that I believe women are more inclusive. Okay. And therefore more likely to incorporate other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. Now the male ego, for example, is something that we women don't have. Mm -hmm. So even when I was a minister, I would want to know what, what are people living with HIV thinking? Have a meeting with them and say, this is what I plan on doing. Do you think it will happen? Mm-hmm. But sometimes males feel like if they do that, it's a sign that they're weak. So we all have the leadership traits. And I think, but what I think I, I believe in is simply that mm-hmm. in our world though, I mean, it's half, women have make half of the species, right. you know, half of the population. Therefore, yes, we should have, you know, in leadership positions, both all ma- both males and females, mm-hmm. so that we share those ideas, we dilute each other, mm-hmm. and we're able to really have a better whole. But mm-hmm. unlike where you just have only males, mm-hmm. males tend to think in terms of principles. Okay. And, you know, yeah. And, you know, for them, you know, if it's two and two is equal to four, mm-hmm. you know, things are either black or white. But females do see the gray in there. And therefore, that the decisions sometimes are based on that grade to say, yeah, it could be this, it could be that. But there's always that aspect. Let's look at it. So, and, and, and that's what happens. So, it, it, I think it, it's really that question to say, in any, my, my idea will be for every country to have women in leadership positions with men. Mm-hmm. If a man is the president, can the deputy be the, a, a woman? If a woman is the president, can the deputy be, you know, a, a, a male? And ministers, can we have more ministers who are males and also ministers who are female? You know, so we, we, I think it, it, it would all go well. I mean, right now we have a country, Rwanda, that is 60%, uh, you know, female members of parliament. And, you know, the decisions that are happening there and the speed with which things are happening, 
it, it just show you that when she leads, you know, things do happen. So we, we, we need to be able to, you know, to incorporate those uh, aspects. So what, what is your preferable leadership style, seven leadership, transactional or transformational? Um, both. Okay. In that sometimes, you know, you are coming into a situation where you have to use one kind. But, you know, in another, for example, COVID, you are looking at a situation where nobody knows the solution. You are all looking at it, and therefore it has to be that transformational to say, what are we going to do in, today, in this case? And incorporate everybody's idea. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, basically it, it's really to say phenomena are not the same. Right. And we need to be able to have that mm -hmm. aspect to say we all need each other's ideas to be able to lead and, and accomplish the desired goals. Yeah. So basically that's it. That's it. Okay. I know, I know you have worked for a long time on issues of, uh, of gender equality. Uh, can you talk about yes. policies implemented or proposed, at least in areas you have worked in, uh, to really position women leadership roles, uh, in, I mean, in, real, in, 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 in leadership roles? Uh, we remember the, the late Kenyan Nobel uh, Peace Laureate uh, Mangari Matai said, the higher you go, the fewer women they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me, when I became uh, UNA's regional director mm -hmm. for Eastern and Southern Africa, this is in charge of 20, 24 mm -hmm. countries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I did as regional director was to say, let me call the country director so that I see them, I tell them who I am and, you know, let the ground and how we are going to, to be able to, 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 to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, we have what we call the regional management meeting and they came. They are seated. I come in. I knew very few of them. Mm -hmm. I came in and I'm seeing half of them were white males. Mm. Okay? Yes. You know, I'm looking at them thinking, look, this is our epidemic. In the ultimate, I should be seeing more black faces here. People who can be able to go to those presidents and talk brother to brother, sister to brother, you know, to be able to say, you know, let's look at this. So, and there were a few okay, white females, and then there were like, there were only four, um, you know, two black males and two black uh, females. The rest were all white. I phoned my executive director. We, 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 we said we talked and all that. And immediately I went home, I phoned my executive director and told him, Michelle, this is our epidemic. I need to see more Africans as country directors because, you know, I know for sure, having been a minister, if I take it, any advice from somebody who's coming from the works, it sounds like they're talking down on me. When I'm taking from somebody who's coming from Africa, we are talking brother to brother. So I need to dilute this complexion right away. And he said, you are lucky because there's going to be a... a, 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 a what we call the mobility exercise. And in the mobility exercise, as I looked at who had applied for country directorships, you know, in the mobility exercise, you, you have people are able to, to be moved around. Mm -hmm. So I looked at this and there were some ladies who I knew I had worked with in the AIDS response for the past 20 years. And guess where they were? They were still like P5, you know, P4 positions. And I thought, okay, I said, all of you are applying. And indeed, when I compare sometimes their credentials with who was there, they were, they were better. So we, when I left, and, and that's how the, the way it went, I was able to then put some here, put some here. And sometimes even a head of state, like I had a, a head of state who said to me, um, uh, we hear so-and-so, when one of the directors was leaving, he said, well, he's leaving. I said, yeah, he'll be leaving, he's going to Geneva. And she looked at me and, you know, and said, can you, can the next time, can you bring us somebody, you know, of your own, of our own kind, because he seems to be telling down, uh, you, know, you know, telling us down rather than discussing possibilities. And indeed, I made sure that I sent a, a female to her. And before we knew it, that country had actually passed the laws on child marriage, forbidding child marriage, and they were working directly with this woman. So it, it, it was really that. So uh, what I'm saying to you is when I left, 
in, in, in 2017, half of the people, of, of the leaders, the country directors, were females. Mm. And when I looked at the proportion now, three quarters of them were Africans. You know, so we still have it. So the, I, I was seeing therefore that mixture where, yeah, we are all together. Rather than have, you know, a whole in Africa, have a whole, you know, battalion of faces that come from Europe. Like, what do they know about our situation? That they can be able to articulate at country level and convince ministers and presidents. I knew, uh uh, they wouldn't. And I think that's part of the reason why then we became the only region that had a 24% decline in new infections. Other regions did not. They had actually, in fact, in Asia, they had a 10% up in new infections. So that, uh, that's how come I then became the chair of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition because they were saying, look, you have done quite a lot in your region. So try to do the same thing uh, in terms of the world so that we can be able to see in terms of lobbying for sex workers, lobbying for a lot of people. So it was really great that we were able to do that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, somebody said that, uh, Professor Clo, for uh, thank you for availing your time. This conversation is very insightful, Professor, in the case of Botswana and according to the Office of President. The first state of emergency was meant to combat the spread of COVID, but as it is, the numbers have been rising still still with the SOE, like SOE, in place, and now a second SOE has been defected. Do you think that the SOE can combat the spread? And what advice would you give the leadership of Botswana to tackle the pandemic? Well, the SOE can combat the spread in the sense that it makes certain funds available for, uh, you know, for use to, to be used in the COVID response. But you cannot just be throwing money alone at, you know, at, 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 in this particular instance. There has to be also personnel. And that's where it is lacking. We still have not engaged people at community level. You know, in the first state, uh, in the, the first SOE, food was delivered to people. Guess what happened? They were using the same Bombabu Ipele who are firstly very few in number and therefore scattered all over the place. We heard reports of food that is still rotting. In fact, members of parliament were complaining that in their uh, constituencies, food in the storages was rotting because there was nobody to distribute that food. So therefore you need to be able to engage at community level, to be able to say when we bring food, where are the people who are going to be engaged? The people who do ipelechen, can they be engaged to be the, the ones to distribute that food? Some people were even complaining on the way the food was distributed. The president said nobody will go hungry. We had reports of people who went hungry, mainly because this very, bo, the, the, the boma ipelech, mm -hmm. sometimes when they saw it, like, okay, you have a, a very nice looking house, they will not get there. They, they will say, ah, no, they, this one's, that they look to be okay. Uh, this this house is is is, is great. They they, they have they, they should be having enough food. Yet the people in there would be starving. In the case was my own mother. I'm in South Africa. I hear everybody in the neighborhood has been given food. A a 93 year old has been left out. My mother. So I phoned the member of parliament to say, how come my mother didn't get the the, the ration of food? And mm. from what I hear, nothing. She never actually got that food. Mm -hmm. But because she has a big house mm -hmm. uh, with nice trees in the home, <laughs> a walled house with electricity, mm -hmm. they figured this one is fine. Yet they know that her children are not in the country. She's, she's, she's a 93-year-old, she's long retired. Mm -hmm. So I had to phone them and say, look, that woman, that house was built in 1963 when we were little. It's mm -hmm. still like that. It doesn't mean that she has money now. She is a retiree, a, you know, an elder adult for that matter. But it always was like, oh, no, we look and see. There's been so many problems in the distribution. Up to today, my, never, my mother never got that. So we had to arrange ourselves, maybe arrange with cousins to say, I'll send money, go buy food. You know, so those are some of the things. Yet if they had just engaged people at community level who even know this woman, 
they could have gone and just distributed food to each and every household the way it was supposed to, to be done. So it's really that. State of emergency will help, but it will help only if there are people on the ground to be able to implement what needs to be done. That's really all. Wow. Um, somebody else just uh, forwarded another question. I know you have to go, Professor. Um, what about policies aimed at protecting women at home and even at work? And he said, I know you have worked on these issues. Well, policies are there. But you know, as in every other country, policies and laws are made, but their implementation is something else. You could have a law at work on sexual harassment. We mm -hmm. have many such laws, mm -hmm. uh, policies on sexual harassment. But guess what? Sexual harassment occurs between two people and half the time when you tell your story, nobody wants to believe you. Why? Because they won't have uh, the, the whistleblowers. They won't have people who can be able to directly deal with that immediately. So you find that the structures are not there to be able to, 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 to engage in the implementation of these very policies. Mm -hmm. So that the policies are there. We even like in my, when I was a minister, mm -hmm. because a lot of us were, I mean, we, there were very few of us women in parliament, but we were very strong women. There were eight of us only. Mm -hmm. But we passed a law on domestic violence. Mm -hmm you know, a, a, a Domestic Violence Act. And we worked actually with our male counterparts and we were able to pass that law. But the point is, it's a law. The law needs to be domesticated at community level to ensure that there are people who can be there to implement that law, to ensure that when a woman goes to the police mm -hmm. to a report that she has been violated by an intimate partner, she is not told, no, go and make peace at home, you know? So, and that's still what happens. So we've had somebody killed just a few weeks ago, killed by a boyfriend, and she had already gone. Actually, it was an fiance. Mm -hmm. This person was supposed to be paying bride price for her in, in a few weeks' time. She went to the police to report, and the police were saying, uh, what do the adults say at home? No, go and make peace. You seem to be having fewer problems. And this woman was saying, this guy, I need a protection order against him. She never got it, and she died. So that the, the policies are great, they're there. Implementation, zilch. And you know, that's the problem. Mm. Uh, Professor, your last word and your message of hope to our country, <laughs> or to Africa, yes. or to the world. <laughs> okay. Um, my, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have my message of hope to the world. Mm -hmm. It's ready to say, um, we are together in this. Uh, for once, I mean, at no time in history has the light shone upon the world as a whole than it is right now. And I think it has been an emphasis to say we are one. What happens to one country happens to us. Therefore, be able to work together to ensure that we defeat whatever is happening. Uh, but you also to, to the citizens of the world to say, look, our leaders commit themselves. Right now they have committed themselves to the sustainable development goals. And goal three does say end the epidemics of TB, uh, HIV and malaria and other epidemics. And therefore we should be able to know and read to say what have our own leaders committed themselves to and make them, hold them accountable. I found that, for example, in Botswana, even if you say to somebody, and to say, what has Botswana committed to doing about them? And in every, in every country, really, should be, should, should, should be able to do that. The world is, the, 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 uh, to say that the, the world as I see it, our future is bright, but mm -hmm. our future is only bright as we hold our leaders accountable and ensure that when it comes to health, finance, and other safety measures, they are right there and they can be able to work together collaboratively to ensure a safer world. So it's really, you know, my take. And to simply say for women, my last word to you is, you have to join politics. Be right in there. I know people say politics are dirty, is dirty. 
But we have to go and dirty ourselves. Be right there where decisions are made because without women there, there will be no gender you know, sensitive policies, policies. We need gender sensitive policies. We need people there who can be able to speak for women. Remember in the Bible, when Adam was asked, what did you do when you know, they were naked? Adam could have given any other excuse, but <laughs> guess what he said? He said, the woman that you, made, you gave me made me do it. That shows you that men never spoke for us then. Men will <laughs> never speak for us. So you better go out there and speak for yourselves. It's as simple as that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a great conclusion. Uh, uh, right. Somebody's asking, are you planning to run for higher office someday? <laughs> um, I, 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 people have asked me. I don't mind trying. I'll see. But I, it will depend. I, I have a lot of work to do in terms of still giving my thoughts to the world and yeah. working for the world. So I'll, I'll see. Like right now, I'm working for nothing. I'm not being paid to be the you know, Global HIV Prevention Coalition. It's something that I do. I get an allowance here and there. But mm. I, I'm happy doing it because I'm seeing progress in the world. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I think yes. you have a lot of people behind you. A lot of people It would be great. <laughs> it would be great to have people campaign you for me. That, that yeah. would make me run. And I, can, I promise you, if I became president, a lot of things would happen right. for better. No, I believe you. I, I believe that. I believe you. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Professor. I thank you for, you know, a lot for uh, coming into our show today. So God bless you. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you to all the other participants. It was great uh, sharing my ideas with you. And, I hope and, I see you one of these days. And before you go, somebody said that, you know, it is an honor to be your student today, Professor. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. I learned a ton of knowing nothing about life in Botswana. Honored to be. They, they, well, <laughs> I'm hoping it will encourage them to, to visit Botswana. Remember, it was said that Botswana mm -hmm. is the original Garden of Eden. So we're hoping people will come and visit and see where they originated. That right. would really be great. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm reading some of the charts this side, so that's really great. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Bria. Thank you so much, Professor.